I have a new book out from Fantagraphics uh, called How to Be Happy, and it's a collection of the short comics I've done for the past seven years. Um, so to promote the book uh, this whole summer, <clears throat> all of um, July I was on a book tour uh, on the West Coast, and so I was thinking a lot about what we want from signings and, and readings and, and artist talks, and, uh, and if there's a sort of connection that we're looking uh, that we're hoping to get in real life um, beyond what we get from the books themselves. Um, so putting together this artist talk, I've, I've been thinking a lot about truth and uh, fiction and uh, what readers and creators hope to, to get out of meeting one another. OK, <laughs> I'm really nervous. Sorry about this. Uh, so here goes my, my artist talk. Uh, so my name is Eleanor Davis, and I grew up in Sparks, Nevada. Um, my first love wasn't actually comics, it was uh, dance. Um, I was touring with my not modern dance uh, jazz troupe when I was, I was 15. You know, we were kind of a big deal. I know you, you can't, I don't really look like a dancer now, but uh, I was really, really into dance as a teenager. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm at the top, third from the left. I was the youngest one in my troupe. Uh, then when I was 16, I got my first boyfriend. Um, his name is Charlie, he's the guy on the right. He was super cool in a band. Uh, then, you know, after we'd been dating for a little bit, I got mono. <laughs> uh, so I was in bed for about a month and I couldn't dance at all. Um, and that was, that was when I first really started reading comics. Uh, my older brother lent me his X-Men comics and I, I got really obsessed with them. Um, and from there, the, the whole uh, Marvel DC universes, uh, the, the, the superhero comics I was reading were, were powerful and aggressive in a way that uh, was totally unlike the, the world of jazz dance that I was, I was used to. Uh, and I hadn't, I hadn't really drawn a lot before this, but I started drawing every day. I got really obsessed with it. Um, after, and after I got better from mono, I still only wanted to draw. Um, I, my mom uh, was really passionately you know, involved with dance herself, and it really broke my mom's heart when, she, uh, when I uh, quit the dance troupe. But uh, jazz just couldn't compete with my new love of, of comic books. Um, this is a panel from a Batman comic that I drew. I, I tried to turn it in as a school assignment. I don't think my teacher was that thrilled. It's <laughs> called The Eight Parts of Speech. Uh, and I remember being especially pleased with how the Batmobile turned out. I was like, this is the best thing I've ever drawn. So fucking good. Uh, so I continued to read comics and draw through high school, but I didn't really have a community at all. Um, I was becoming a feminist, and the objectification of, of women in the comics I loved uh, started really to get me down. Um, so I, I didn't feel like there was a place for me in comics, and I wound up majoring in women's studies at uh, NSC, Nevada State. Uh, and my, my sophomore year, purely by chance, I, I found this mini comic, Le Faire et Le Chat, and I found it was actually tucked inside a Bukowski book at the NSC library just uh, totally randomly. I don't know how it got there. It's, it's by Julie Desay, obviously, as you can tell. Um, it's, uh, so it's, it's called Le Faire at Le Chat, which I guess means, um, I don't know, my pronunciation is terrible, but I guess it means the lighthouse and the pussy, I guess. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, this like weird uh, biography of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> uh, so I'd never heard of zines or mini comics before this. And looking at Doucet's work, I suddenly realized comics weren't just something put out by Marvel or DC, but there was something anyone could make. Uh, women could make them. Uh, even I could make them. Um, so I started making my own mini-comics. And I, I, my first zine was called Earth 3. That's the cover of it. You can see it's approved by the Vagina Code Authority. <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I thought I was really funny. <laughs> uh, and I put out an issue of Earth 3 once a month for two years. So it was probably the high point of productivity in my life. <laughs> Um, then in 2001, I went to my, uh, my first comic convention. It was in San Diego. And uh, Julie Doucet was one of the guests that year, amazingly. And after she had been such a huge influence on, on me and on my life, I, I finally got to meet her, which was, uh, you know, it was, it was just incredible. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe that I was, like, even in the, in the same room with her. Um, she signed her, her book, Leve Tajambe, for me, and uh, I took this selfie of us. I'm totally freaking out in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> and a week later, I dropped out of college to pursue comics full time. 70% of that story was a lie. 
I'm going to start over from the beginning. <clears throat> My artist talk. Actually, I was born in Tucson, Arizona. My mom and stepdad taught at this little hippie school I went to for basically my whole life. Uh, the school is really liberal, but uh, my folks are very religious, and since I'm an only child, uh, I grew up kind of isolated. Um, I'm the, the, the kid on the left in the blue shorts. It's all, all anxious, anxious kid. Um, my stepdad really, really didn't, you know, he was not into comics at all. Uh, so I, I learned about comics from my mom, who loved Little Lulu when she was growing up. Uh, and when my, my dad wasn't at home, she would take out her old Little Lulu issues and, and read them to me, the great John Stanley. Uh, it wasn't until I found out about manga in middle school that I, that I got really hooked. I had won an essay writing uh, contest, weirdly enough, um, and it was like about international relations or something, and, and the prize was a, a trip to Japan where I stayed with a host family. And uh, that was, um, so I, I lived with a Japanese host family for a month and, and uh, I learned about anime and manga. So I'm, I'm in the middle there, the long hair, the longest my hair's ever been. Uh, Japanese comics were so fun and insane and sexy, everything that I wasn't allowed to be. Uh, I especially love Rumiko Takahashi's work, the spread from Ranma one half. Um, by the time I got to the U.S., I, I knew who my community was. Uh, I joined an anime club, and then I started drawing my own comics and bumming rides to go to conventions and in, instead of skirt church camp and uh, I, chatting on message boards late into the night. You know, this was the uh, late 90s. <laughs> sure, we were, we've all been there. Uh, so here's some sketches that I did. There's a, I had a huge crush on this boy who was uh, into marine biology. His shirt says whales on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then when I was a junior in high school, my best friend Catherine Guillen uh, gave me a copy of uh, this Linda Berry book, uh, To the Lighthouse. Um, and the book doesn't have anything to do with Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, but uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, and Linda Berry mentions in the, in the introduction that, um, that Woolf's work was very inspirational to her. Uh, and Berry's work was like a, a punch in the gut for me. And it was about real life, you know, about real kids with real emotions. Um, so I, I started to write to, to Linda Berry. Uh, I, I sent her my very first mini comics. And, uh, you know, she's, she's such an incredible person, and, and she actually wrote me back. Uh, when, I, when I got a letter back from her, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, it felt like a, a sign. Um, anyway, so here's the... Here's the letter, I still have it, it's framed in my house. <laughs> uh, my stepdad had gone to the, the U of A and, and majored in uh, chemistry, and that's what he was expecting me to do as well. But uh, I, I told him, um, after getting the letter from Linda, I told him that I wanted to go to art school. The next year I was majoring at the Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, majoring in sequential art. That one was about 70% lies. I'm going to start over from the beginning again. My artist talk. The real story is that I was born in Michigan, but my folks moved to Miami, Florida when I was four years old. I don't have very many memories of Michigan. I don't remember when this picture was taken of me and my sisters. My parents were both therapists, so of course me and all my sisters are, are pretty crazy. Uh, we had a lot of anger and smoking and um, drinking and sneaking out to bunk shows and stuff. Uh, here's an uncharacteristically smiley picture of me. Uh, I was 14 when I got my first King Cat by John Porcelino. Uh, they sold it at a, uh, the record shop that I used to go to and um, <laughs> I'm incredibly embarrassed to say that I, I think I shoplifted it. <laughs> it's super <laughs> I feel really embarrassed about it now. And it was the issue where uh, um, John talks about reading a, one of, a Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf and having this crazy existential experience afterwards. Uh, so there's John like freaking out after having read A Room of One's Own. Um, King Cat was like a little life raft. John P. wrote about love and pain and sincerity, uh, uh, love and pain with sincerity and a, and a frightening openness. Um, King Cat is what pulled me out of the overwhelming irony and nihilism that I'd been struggling with. 
so I, I wound up becoming a therapist myself, and although I never really got into any comics other than King Cat, uh, sometimes I, I, I like to recommend Perfect Example or, or Map of My Heart to my, um, my clients, especially my, my teenage clients who are struggling. Um, and a couple years back, I heard that John P. was coming through my city, uh, I live in Athens, Georgia, on a book tour, and uh, he was giving a presentation about his work uh, in a hair salon. Um, and I was really excited about going, but I entered the wrong time into my phone, and I, I wound up uh, showing up uh, two hours late <laughs> after he'd already left, the presentation was over. So it was a super bummer. I, I never did get to meet John um, after he had been such a, a big influence on my life. But, but uh, in the corner, I found this little crumpled up piece of paper that had this little doodle of a bird on it. And I, I, I think maybe John drew it. I like to think that John drew it. And that story is almost 90% lies. <laughs> Here's another story. You were born, but you don't remember that part. There are some photos from when you were very little where you think you can remember the time the photo was taken, but maybe it's just that you've looked at the photo so often you've created a false memory. For a long time, you didn't know how to read, and that felt normal. There is a dog, or a man, or a bridge, or a storm, or a night, and it was pretty bad. Your memories start to be a little clearer after you turned eight or nine. There was a boy or a girl you thought about a lot. You would look at their photo in the yearbook a lot. You kissed their photo once or maybe more than once. There was some weird porn you found in the woods. There is a certain toy or brand of shoe or game you needed, really, really needed, and your parents wouldn't get it for you. There was a book or a movie or comic or a video game, and you fell in love with it. It made you feel high almost, tight in the chest with the potential of it. It was giving you a message about who you could become, you thought. You spent a lot of time looking at the package or the cover. You would trace the picture over and over. Later, at some point, you kissed somebody or they kissed you. And you probably had sex, thank God. You're Facebook friends with that person now, and it seems like they're doing OK. They moved to Minnesota, and they're really into horses. <laughs> and there were times when you were driving around in a truck with some friends, and you felt really good and giddy. There's a certain song on the radio, and you were so filled with it, filled with joy, that your stomach was like a lava lamp, and you had trouble breathing. And for some other reason, for a long time, you are extremely unhappy. And there was someone you loved a lot, more than anything in the world. But still, you got into a huge fight with them and screamed, fuck you, and you threw something. And there was a book, or a movie, or a comic, or a video game, or a band, probably a band, and you fell in love with it. This time it was for a different reason, because you had so many emotions, like your whole teenage body was a boner of emotions, and the only way you could find any relief was from this band expressing the kind of anger or fear or despair or love you felt. And when you were a teenager, you thought it was all about to be over really soon, and in some ways it was, but in most ways it wasn't, in most ways, it just kept on going. And now you are an adult. And you thought you would grow up to be a certain sort of person, but you didn't. You grew up to be another sort of person. And sometimes you have a strong feeling that you do not know anyone else, and no one else knows you. 
You have a strong feeling that none of us can ever know one another. You know there's nothing you can say to anyone that would be true or authentic or that could help. You feel strongly that you're living inside a very thick shell. Inside it's very dark. Inside you feel safe. And there is a book or a movie or a comic or a video game and you fall in love with it. In this case, actually, it is a book. It is To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. You fall in love with it because it tells you who you can be and because it provides empathy and because it's like a magnifying glass that you hold up to your smooth, gray, opaque life and it shows you the glittering fractals it's actually made of, microscopic and sharp and painful and real. You get obsessed with Virginia Woolf. She knows and understands you. You read everything she's written, her diaries, A Room of One's Own, To the Lighthouse, Between the Acts, Churchill's Change, the biography of Betty Friedan, everything from her psychedelic period in the 70s, the terrible experimental novel she co-wrote with David Byrne, her essays for Slate and The Believer. <laughs> she is a monolith in modern literature. Her greatest works were written after, at the final moment, she realized she'd made the wrong choice, and she fought her way back out of the river, choking and spluttering the water out of her lungs, emptying the stone from her pockets, letting the air shudder back into her body. She is now 132 years old. She's shrunk over the many, many years. She weighs about 60 pounds and she's nearly translucent. She lost an eye in the Stonewall riots. Except for her many servants and doctors, she lives in solitude, confined to a vat and covered in tubes that are keeping her alive. She has over 200,000 followers on her hilarious and irreverent Twitter. <laughs> And meanwhile, you've been making comics, of course. Did I mention that comics have been the driving force in your life, all you care about and all you're any good at? Sometimes making comics is fun, and sometimes it's a misery. You're worried they aren't good, or worse, that they aren't worthwhile. But when things are going well, you fall in love with the ideas you have, which are always perfect in their infancy. And even when they grow up shriveled and deformed and not how you wanted, you still love them. You work very slowly, but everyone is encouraging and patient. Finally, after years and years, you put out a book, a collection of short comics, all your best work. You feel good about it. You want Virginia to read it. It's impossible to get an audience with Virginia Woolf these days because she's so famous and old and incredibly frail. You have no choice but to break into her maximum security mansion, <laughs> jumping over rooftops and dodging lasers. <laughs> After crawling through a maze of air ducts, you drop out of a vent in the ceiling and into the room where she's suspended in her vat of liquid, and you finally see the person who wrote the books that are the most important to you in the entire world. She is very, very small. Who are you, says Virginia Woolf. What are you doing here? You don't know how you convinced her not to call security. Maybe it was the fumbling sincerity with which you pulled your book out of your layers of authentic ninja garb. The book is garish with color in the darkness. Virginia is far too weak to hold it, of course, but she lets you hold it for her and she tells you when to turn each page. After she's finished, she says, I liked it. You did, you say. This is beyond your wildest dreams. It's flawed and self-important and raw, says Virginia Woolf, and the print quality on the first story isn't great. It's kind of pixelated. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, it moved me in a way that I've never felt before. Really? 
you breathe. Really, says Virginia Woolf, not because it's a great work of literature, but because I knew, somehow, reading it, that you, more than anyone else, know me. You understand me, and I no longer feel alone. I've been waiting for you my whole long, long life. And with this, she reaches out her ancient arms, as slender as reeds, dragging countless tubes dripping liquid from the vat, and you reach out your arms to her in turn. And your lips meet, first with skin touching skin, but then getting softer and lighter until your lips sort of melt into one another. And then your whole faces are melting into one another, and your arms wound round each other's bodies are sinking down into the skin, through the bones which are now soft in emitting light, until your chest is inside Virginia Woolf's chest, or maybe her chest is in your chest, and your legs are sticking together like taffy. And now you are one body, floating gently above the vat in the dark, amorphous, glowing, and soft, the heartbreak of isolation over. The end. Um, I'd like for people to be able to see the. Yeah, so we just leave that up yeah, for the entirety of our that'd be talk. Super. So um, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you very much to all the people who donated their, donated their their childhood photos and childhood artwork uh, um, to use in the presentation. And thank you to all the amazing artists whose uh, artwork I used in the presentation. If y'all want to catch the. Uh, um, panel um, that uh, Emily and Sam and Rebecca are on. That's at uh, two fifty. Uh, it's two fifty six now. That's at three. And me and Tom are going to do a, a Q and A after this. So, thanks so much for coming out. I was actually I was actually really glad when Eleanor told me that. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, great. I, I, th that she told me that y that your people might release to go to the <laughs> next panel because I would hate to think that people were storming out of the room angrily <laughs> when I showed up next to you on stage. I hope you know this is Sunday at SBX, and we're all a little bit. A, a lot of us are a little bit. A lot of us are a little tired. I hope that we'll just have, a, especially after that magnificent presentation, that we'll have a relaxed conversation. And I hope as many of you will join in as possible because your questions are a lot more interesting than mine, first of all. And also, I get to ask her questions every now and then for, for publication. So this is an extra indulgence on my part. So I will throw it to you guys uh, as many times as possible in the, in the next spare 20, 25 minutes, precious 20, 25 minutes we have. You know, and I'm going to ask the broadest question in the world just to sneak in a couple of my own first which is after you put out a book, like a first major book, and it's all of these short stories, and you've lived with them before, mm -hmm. it's always really fascinating to me when a young artist does that, or an artist, any artist does that, does it change the way you look at that suite of stories? Does it feel like an ending? Does it feel like you have a, uh, you've come to a stopping point? Or with those, with those stories in particular, or even a kind of storytelling? Yeah. Um, I I've, I've talked about this a little bit before, um, that I, I always felt like I was, uh, did a wide variety of, of stories and that my stuff was kind of all of them out, but when I collected them, them together, I realized that I was actually kind of writing the same story over and over. Um, the story of how to deal with being alive. Um, <coughs> So it'll be interesting to see if I figure that out. <laughs> if I can suddenly start writing stuff that's not about struggling with being alive. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, you know, is there something that you thought was in there that you did? Is there something specifically that you thought was in there that you didn't see then when you looked at the stories, or was that, or was it just you were just surprised by the kind of yeah, the the, the, the specificity the of the of the story? Can you talk a little about the curation process then? Were you what was there was there anything that was hard, particularly hard to leave out, or particularly hard to kind of not not use? Um, I, I guess my one of the favorite things, a piece of mine that folks respond to a lot is a, an old mini comic that I made called The Beast Mother. And I didn't include that, which um, I felt good about, but I, I know that that was something that other people were, were sad that it wasn't included. Uh, but I felt sad because of that. But it didn't, the, 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 the Beast Mother is, all the stuff in, in this collection is kind of autobiographical. I mean you, you and you have talked about this before, but wasn't there an assumption on people's part when the Beast Mother came out that it was autobiographical? Yeah. <laughs> they were like, Oh man, what's her relationship with her mother like? She must be horrible and I was like, ah, maybe I should watch myself. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, given I mean given that and you, you work in in a, a lot of your comics are very um, I don't want to say allegorical, but there's a, a, a mythological element, especially some of your early work. And there's a, 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 a while they are still highly personal, and they're open to interpretation like that. I mean, how much do you worry about? Is intentionality a, a figure, a big issue? Oh my God. Um, I mean, I wonder how much are you, when you put a story out there, are you looking for a specific considered effect? Or how much do you think of as art as putting out? I mean, like when you talk about the Beast Mother story getting out there and people having this specific interpretation of it, it's based on a misapprehension, but is that is their reaction to mm -hmm. it. I mean, how comfortable are you kind of with that give and take with the audience and what an audience might find in it? Or do you really want an intentional kind of message or metaphor um, communicated with a lot of your work? That's a good question. Um, I think that I'm... <laughs> I think that I'm... We're going to stand back here. It's the other it's way. It's being worked on. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I can't remember what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just wondering about the, the, the issue of intentionality versus interpretation. I think that I'm, I'm really uh, controlling with my stuff, and I, so I have a specific thing that I'm trying to do, and a specific reaction that I'd like folks to have, but I know from how I how I respond to artwork that I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't like stuff that seems didactic, or where it feels like it's leading me by the hand. So I, I know that folks need to be able to feel like they've come to a conclusion on their own. So I try to sort of leave it very, I'm trying to, to, to come, to have folks come to a certain emotional, have a, a certain emotional reaction, but feeling like they've come to that themselves, rather than that I've kind of bullied them into it. Um, and so sometimes I leave it open enough that people don't know what I'm trying to say, or they interpret it differently. And that's fine too. I mean, it, it can be frustrating, but, but I can handle it. How much is I mean? How much is the uh, you know, the process of getting a book out there and answering questions about it? I mean, especially given the presentation that we saw, where you kind of play or play with the questions of of the really specific, you know, linear fact reported. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much is that? Is 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 it when people ask you, you know, about what a certain work means or a certain is it is it unpleasant for you to kind of do the the process that process or kind of talk about those issues or and not a way that you would like to have a relationship with that art? I think, I think it's okay. I think that uh, I'm, I'm relatively comfortable with being, with oversharing. So if someone asks me about what something's about, I can, I can usually feel relatively comfortable with, with just saying, saying what it is. Uh, and, and sometimes it's important to, to, to me or to the reader or to people that I know that, you know, if somebody thinks like, oh, is this about, you know, your relationship with your mom, for example, that I could say, no, it's not, actually. 
or my mom was very good. <laughs> this is nightmarish. You, the first line of your speech, when you, you said, or when you presented, you said you're happy to be here at SBX. And I, I remember talking to you. You've done, you did Comic Con International too. And I, I always want to ask, a, I always like asking convention questions of, of while we're at a convention. I mean, this is this isn't something you do a lot of. You don't do a lot of convention appearances. What does it mean for you to be kind of in your, your, you know, surrounded by your peers and you're kind of engaging with an audience that way, and right, or, or this way? And what what is it? Was there a source of the discomfort that you had in the past doing this? Is it? Is it? I mean, how has it been to kind of get get the book out there, get in front of the book, and get in front of an audience for the book? I've been feeling pretty good about it, but it's also been, um, it's also been uh, challenging. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons I make art, one of the reasons I like art, is because I have a very difficult time connecting with other human beings. Uh, and when I can connect with other people, it feels wonderful. And when I can't, uh, it feels really painful. Uh, so I think one of the reasons that it can be really difficult to go to conventions is because it's, it's uh, you're seeing so many people and so many people who are important to you, uh, so many people who's whose artwork has is, is affected you or changed you in some way. Um, or, or, you know, in my case, lots of folks that I know online and who I consider to be my, my friends are important. And, um, and in a crowded convention hall, mm -hmm. I don't feel that connection often, uh, which can be really distressing. To me, I feel very upset about it often. Um, so I've been trying to be proactive <coughs> about rejecting that those those feelings of disconnection. I've been trying to like make sure to look people in the eye and, and find out who they are and let them know who I am and um and, and, and do this doing this presentation was helpful to me because it was kind of talking about some of those struggles mm -hmm. and uh, some of why why I love art and some of why I make art, and, uh, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where do you think you tend to find kinship with your fellow artists, your peer group? I, you know, you've talked a little bit, uh, you talked in, in an earlier panel about uh, a couple of peers that you respected, so I know that you think of your, you might think of yourself as part of a, a peer group, or you have artistic fellow travelers. Where do you think you connect with some of your fellow artists, some of the better artists out there? Like, and on, on what, artistically? Yeah, artistically? where do you feel like you guys have a, do you feel like you have a shared common interest with other artists when you you feel that, you know, that, that a person is a peer? Or is, yeah. it, is it you're all trying the same thing? Is it you're all at the same age and kind of going through the same vocational issues? I mean, do you feel like there are other artists um, like you, that are exploring the same issues as you, exploring the same things as you, or in a way that you that you enjoy or yeah, or feel um, kinship to. I guess, in uh, we don't know. Me, Tom interviewed me a couple of weeks back, and, and we're kind of doing a little bit of a similar question, so I'm, yeah, I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit, which um, makes me feel sheepish. But you guys <laughs> haven't heard any of that stuff yet. Yeah. But uh, I, I. Um, um, I feel really close to and inspired by and excited by all the uh, women that are making comics now. Um, there's just, you know, when I started making comics, uh, there didn't feel like there was, it definitely felt skewed more to a third more male cartoonists. And uh, watching this sort of burgeoning of, of all these really amazing uh, women artists has been uh, just incredibly exciting. And uh, I don't know how to describe it, like, like it makes, you, makes me feel really powerful. And just watching them be extraordinary and refuse to be small and refuse to be afraid 
makes me feel less afraid. It makes me feel less small. And uh, so that's been really neat. <laughs> it's been really wonderful. I would love to start taking questions from the audience. And this, this gentleman jumped the gun by having his hand up a long time ago. So please, sir, go first. Well, you were talking about uh, the connection you feel with the current female artists out there. Mm -hmm. Do you look back at all to like Roberta Gregory or, you know, women artists? And are we able to hear the gentleman? He asked about kinship with past artists. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really, really loved Aline Kaminsky's work when I was younger. I was very excited about that. Of course, I was very excited by Linda Berry's work. Um, I guess when, when you're watching, when you're younger and you're reading works by an older artist, uh, you can, that can be exciting because you hope to attain that someday or, you know, it's an example of what's possible. But you don't, you don't realize that they had to struggle with some of the same things that you might be in the middle of struggling with, or at least I didn't realize that at the time. Whereas watching my peers, be really strong and work really hard and be really successful. I'm, I feel more aware of their, what they're overcoming. Good question, thank you. Thank you. We have another question? Yeah. Hey, um, I'm curious, uh, it's, um, based on my recent experiences of uh, collecting work that had done over a period of time and hadn't looked at in a while, if you had looked at particularly uh, like the more fantastical like, dreamlike narratives and saw things in it about yourself or about your work or, or ideas or feelings that you didn't see at the time or, or also ways of drawing um, since you're working through so many um, different kind of like modulations of aesthetics and like ways of handling media. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also interested in uh, how you organize Very small sketches with a lot of negative space come in between um, these more like quote unquote like what we think is fully realized um, works and how they play off each other and how they inform each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Andy. That was two different questions. Uh, the first one was if I look back on my more surrealist stuff and, and felt like I saw stuff in it after the fact that I wasn't aware of when I when I drew it. I think. And then the second was how uh, how I organized the work in the book, which is which is really various. Um, I guess the answer to the first question is that uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about the, the fancy stuff. Um, I, I'm I'm afraid that when I look back on a lot of that fancy stuff, which is older, that mostly what I think about is how much I wanted to be. Uh, you know, Joan Spar, <laughs> rather than, you know, what I was saying about myself. It feels more like I was still working to find my voice. Um, and I was kind of scared about my stories being boring, so I was put a lot of freaky monsters in, try to hope that they would kind of pull it into being something interesting on their own. Uh, the second question was about all the the variety of stories, which was a combination of work that I did for various anthologies, with No Brow and all, um, and, and scrappier stuff. The anthology work tends to be really, really tight and more classic comics. Uh, the scrappier stuff tends to be stuff that I sort of just vomited into my sketchbook in a sort of compulsive way. and. Uh, yeah, so I tried to sort of mix the two up. I feel like there's very different feelings. Um, the the more edited stuff is kind of claustrophobic and uptight, and the other stuff is raw and more rough. Um, I tried to organize it sort of thematically into stories that I felt fit together. 
<laughs> we have another question. Yes? I've been thinking a lot lately about um, truth versus fiction in artwork, and a lot of people have very distinct opinions on making a distinction between them. Um, what is your relationship with truth in your work, and how important is it to you to have a distinction between what's true and what's not? That's a very good question. The, the question was about the distinction between truth and fiction in artwork. Uh, I don't, my working theory at the moment is that all good artwork is nonfiction and that there is no fiction. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> I, I, I find that with my own work that it's all autobiographical in some way. That I've just, you know, made it into a story in some way that works for me. But I'm I'm trying to to translate my own experiences and emotions uh, into into a story that hopefully other people will be able to to empathize with and be able to, to respond to and recognize parts of their own life in it. Um, so I guess my people, th I think that maybe folks who are really good at writing stuff that seems far, far outside their own experience are maybe artists that are just extremely good at being empathetic and widening the scope of their sense of self I don't know if that's true. It's a cute idea. Is, is, is the impetus of a story the the experience that you have? Do you start with that? Do you start with a a feeling, a reaction, an event in your own life, and then build a narrative or build a story around that, or does that just kind of come in subconsciously as you kind of deal with the practicalities of this happened, that happened, this happened? Um, I guess. I usually have an image in my mind that's powerful and <coughs> is sticky, that sticks in my mind, and then I build a narrative about, around it. Um, and the, I, I find that the image in my mind is usually sticky because it is, it is attached to a, a problem or attached to an emotion, um, attached to something important. We have another question? Anybody? Yes, please. Uh, I think your answer was fair on the basis of truth and nonfiction, but I wonder if it might be good to think about fiction and nonfiction, mm -hmm. um, both of which would hopefully contain truths. But I, I wonder if you would agree that it might not be good to lose the distinction such that we go to nonfiction sometimes as documents Truth made into metaphor. Yeah, that's fine. I totally no. I don't have any bone with with nonfiction. Thank you very much for that clarification. Is there another question? Another question? You know, I have a, a question about your 
And someone who said they'd kill me if I didn't ask a question about your awesome color sense oh, and your you. awesome approach to color. I mean, your books are beautiful. Thank you. Uh, this book is beautiful if you, get, if, you, if you bought it or had a chance to see it. And is there a, can we, like, is there a way to track a pedigree for like how you, do you develop a color sense? Does, does that come kind of naturally to you? Do you look at other things and kind of work that out on the page? How do you develop kind of a signature color sense? Because I think, you know, like you're one of the artists I could almost look at splotches and know it's you without shapes yeah. and designs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, it makes me really happy when people say they like my colors because I think of myself as being really bad with color. Um, <laughs> and the reason why I, the, the reason why my colors come out like they do is because I just try to keep it really simple, which means I'm usually working with uh, really extreme primary color schemes. Um, I really, really like bright colors. Uh, did anybody have, a, we, um, especially probably the, the women of my age in the audience, uh, Lisa Frank products? <laughs> I really was into Lisa Frank. I had this dolphin binder that was very <laughs> important to me. Uh, I've never been able to quite figure out why anybody would do like a subtle color when you could do like a balls out crazy, awesome, <laughs> hardcore primary fluorescent color. So I just try to uh, super saturate everything. It's my priority. Right. Also, I like that there's a website called colorschemedesigner.com, and you can just look up a color scheme. I mean, are you? Yeah. I mean, there's a but, and there's a thematic element to that too, though, Jerry. Because a lot of your work deals with vibrancy or like life force, even you know, kind of a. I mean, that so is that a way to communicate that that kind of lushness of nature and, I mean, it's not you know not a lot of. Um, Urban landscapes, not a lot of uh, parking lots in your in your work. It's there's, there's a real lushness and vibrancy there. Thank you. Well, I will go ahead and say yes, and uh, accept that you've made me sound very smart. <laughs> <laughs> First time ever. <laughs> um, is there are there any more questions? We are nearing the end of our time, so you know we probably okay. they probably kiss us. Yes, please. Um, so I Lana actually made it to the beginning of the panel, so that I could see the progression of how you. Probably one of the best panel presentations oh. I've ever seen. Thank you. Because it was just really lyrical and wonderful how you evolved it. Thank what gave you the inspiration to kind of present yourself this way and how you piece the whole thing together? Oh. It was great. Thank you. Um, she was asking me how I, I guess how I came up with the presentation. The presentation idea. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I've I've uh, done some presentations before, and they tend to be a standard. I put out the book. Uh, my publisher was like, oh yeah, plus you have to come up with a 15 per uh, minute presentation to do on your book tours, BTW. No big deal, <laughs> just throw something together. And I was like, oh, damn it. Um, and I've done presentations before that were kind of more standard autobiographical, you know, talking about my childhood and stuff. And my uh, childhood is really important to me. My family is really important to me. And the more I tell the story of my childhood, the more it felt like I was telling a lie. And that bothered me a lot. Uh, it bothered me to have words coming out of my mouth that felt like disingenuous when it was talking about how much I loved my parents and how important my sister is to me. Um, so uh, I was complaining about having to do uh, this presentation to my friend Maggie. And she was like, oh, it would be funny if you just lied about everything. <laughs> you just made stuff up. You know, nobody really knows anything about you. You can say whatever you wanted. And uh, I got really excited. <laughs> <laughs> so the first version of the presentation were just lies. And, uh, and then I realized that I wanted to go deeper into it and kind of figured out what yeah, you know, I, I, I was talking a little bit about feeling very, having a hard time connecting with people. And I was feeling really nervous about going on the book tour and meeting so many new people and just staring into so many faces that I felt frightened of not being able to connect to on a, on a, on a level that I would like. Um, and I was like, why the fuck am I doing this? This is why I'm drawing comics. <laughs> so that I can connect to people uh, without having to meet them at all. <laughs> 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 so 
So that's why I did the presentation. Thank you for the question. Did you, uh, are you, are, are you done? Are you done with the tour? Is it, are you doing another tour? Is there a second half? You mentioned it's like a West Coast half, so is there an East Coast half? After this I'm going up to, um, I'm doing a presentation, the same presentation at a, a library tomorrow. Okay. In DC, Tacoma Park with Politics and Prose, and then I'm going up to um, Brooklyn. Okay. Well, I hope if if you get a chance to 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 go see you again, I hope people are, encourage your friends to go go see Eleanor. Are you downstairs right now, or th are you for the rest of the day? Yeah, I'm. I'm I, I sold out of books, and so I'm just going to walk around. Okay. But if anybody has mini comics, if they want to trade, I have a lot of traders left. A lot of minis, but then I've left the old mini comics and, and trade with everybody. In, in addition to this being a wonderful book to read, I, it's a great gift book. I've given it a couple of times. I hope that you'll consider it in your future purchase plans. Her, your original art is really beautiful, so I hope people I hope people think about that perhaps, or the print, any print work you might do, just about just about anything you do. And she's a great follow online in all the various ways you follow someone or stare after someone My online. Twitter's so. funnier in comments. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter's very uplifting. And that's lively. that's mostly true too. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, help me thank Eleanor for spending an hour with us. <laughs>